you may think that the Christmas season is over. But it isn't quite, really. We're still in this time called Epiphany. And uh, Epiphany is a period in the church year when we hear the stories of Jesus being revealed to the world. It begins with this discovery by these wise guys from uh, far away. And they bring their gifts. And it continues on. Stories of Jesus being presented in the temple, of Jesus, uh, as we heard last week, going to uh, uh, Jerusalem with his family and finding his place among the scribes, the Pharisees. And we even come to those stories of his baptism and of him collecting together his disciples. And all of those elements are part of the season of Epiphany. And we really don't end the Christmas season until about February 2nd. Now I know that unless, you know, you're the sort of person that likes to leave them up a little bit longer, a lot of people, you know, maybe January, December 26th, all the decorations come down, or maybe January 1st, all the de decorations come but we can celebrate that discovery of Jesus much longer. And today, we hear a little bit more about the discovery of Jesus as he calls together his disciples. I think the beauty of celebrating this discovery is that in reality, we all are constantly discovering Jesus. A great book I read several years ago was Discovering Jesus Again for the First Time. That's an interesting title. How do you discover somebody again for the first time? But the book lays out a lot of uh, personal testimony from uh, the writer about looking at the scriptures and seeing things that perhaps he missed before, or trying to understand things about Jesus that he didn't pick up in Sunday school. We as Christians are on that constant mission of discovery. Who is Jesus? And more than that, what difference does it make to know who he is? So I encourage us not to put Christmas out of mind just yet, but to keep in mind where are we still discovering Jesus and where do we grow in our understanding of him day by day. Let us pray. Holy, gracious God, we thank you, we praise you for all of your goodness and your mercy. We pray in this time and in this place we might hear your word again for the first time. And that as we find Jesus, that you would reveal him not only to our minds, but also to our hearts. May the meditations of our hearts, the words of my mind, be pleasing to you, O oh God. Amen. <laughs> Our first scripture reading comes to us from Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made 
my mouth like a harp's sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. And surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him? For I have honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. God says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave rulers, kings shall stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, and it remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God! The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, at the beginning of the year, many people make resolutions on ways to improve their lives. Lose weight, quit smoking, take piano lessons, you name it. Now, usually, the way it works is the first day or so, maybe even that first week, there's some real success. You go along and you say, I'm really cutting down on those cigarettes, or I only ate celery all week long. But it's as time goes on, usually within that second week, that things fall apart. Now, there may be great intentions 
but follow through is difficult to achieve in the face of obstacles, difficulty, or discomfort. If you are wanting to diet, you don't really like vegetables, you might have a bit of a problem chewing down the old carrots and broccoli. If you want to get up earlier so that you can start your day, cold mornings like this, all you really want to do is crawl back under the covers and remain where it's warm and toasty. Follow through commitments are also difficult to make in spiritual disciplines. We think about it in other ways. You say you want to be in daily prayer, or maybe you do do daily prayer. The follow-through can be difficult because sometimes you might feel like it's just ritualized, or you might feel like no one's really hearing you. Getting up to go to church on a cold morning can be less appealing than staying there in a warm bed. And regular reading of the Bible presents us with passages we find unpleasant or that we don't understand. And when we face those, instead of trying to discover more about what's going on here, we say, you know, this is too much for me. And we put it aside and say, maybe next year. This is true for anyone. Be they people who have never had any religious experience, trying it out for the first time, or people who have embraced faith all their lives. We all encounter the moments where the follow-through of commitment is difficult. Now, if you understand what I'm saying, because it's been true for you or for someone you know, you might be interested in looking a little more closely at today's gospel passage. What did we see here? Jesus begins assembling the group who would become his followers, his disciples, and his partners in ministry. Now, in particular, he encounters a couple of people who lead John the Baptizer in order to follow him. They see Jesus walk by. John says, there is the Lamb of God. And so they say to themselves, Let's check this guy out. And they go and they follow Jesus. And when Jesus realizes that they're following him, he turns around and he asks, what are you looking for? Now this seems to be a very straightforward question. If someone were following you, you might do the same thing, turn and say, what are you looking for? Or what do you want? Here's the interesting part. It takes an awkward turn, you might say. When Jesus asks, what are you looking for? The new disciples reply, Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? Now that's an odd question to ask. When presented with Jesus' first question, what are you looking for? Are they avoiding Jesus' question? Are they concerned that he should stay in a better bed and breakfast? Maybe they misunderstood him. Or there could be something more significant here. I'll give you a hint. It's the last one. There's something more significant going on here than simply having two guys ask a question that seems to relate nowhere to what Jesus is asking them. The word we translate as stay has deeper meaning than we assume. We hear the word staying and we assume that it is simply referencing a condition of physical placement. Where are you bunking down tonight? Where do you go for supper and to relax when you're done working during the day? 
we think in terms of that physical place. Where are you staying? Well, I'm staying over there. I'm staying with my friends. I'm staying at the hotel. And that seems to be the end of the question of answering. But what these disciples ask is a bit more complicated. Staying refers to the source of one's life and meaning. That question, where are you staying, is a question asking, where is your source of life and meaning? What gives you power? Where and how do you live what sustains you? That's really what the disciples are asking. They are looking for not just information of Jesus' whereabouts. They want to know him, who he is, what makes him tick, what does he have that they need or want. So when Jesus says, what are you looking for? They turn to him and say, we want to know what you have that we don't. We want to know what makes you, you. Now, Jesus' reply to come and see is not just a one-time invitation to take a look at his apartment. Jesus encourages them to come along with him on a journey. When they say, we want to know what sustains you, Jesus says, come along and find out. Stick with me a while and discover what's going on in my life and who I am. And it says that they don't do go and sit with Jesus where he is physically, but that they stay with him, at least that day. The whole day to learn of him and of his ways. But the invitation that Jesus issues to them is also for those who already call themselves disciples because in order to live out their faith, they must abide in and be sustained by the sources of faith. Think of it in these terms. Those who want to be doctors go to medical school and they are required to engage in continuing education. People who want to become gardeners must learn the basics of planting and try to improve their growing methods if they want to create better gardens. Individuals who want to learn a musical instrument must play repetitive scales and exercises, and they need to practice regularly no matter how great their skill advances over time. In like manner, those who are not Christians should learn all they can about Jesus Christ in order to follow him. And lifelong Christians need to pray, read scripture, and continue learning about faith matters if they hope to grow spiritually. Of course, there are always going to be obstacles. As mentioned before, if we take on a new endeavor, the reality of what discipline really means can become a disappointment. You may be a Christian, you may come to church on Sundays, you may do some praying, you may have done a little bit of Bible reading, but you might say, this year, I'm going to read a little bit of scripture every single day. But sometimes the obstacles of life come in. You come home, you're exhausted, you're not feeling terribly well. All you really want to do is veg out in front of the television, and you say, I'll do a little extra reading tomorrow. And the next day you come home and you say, you know, I could do that extra reading, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe not tonight. My back hurts. I need to do some other chores around the house first. Maybe this weekend I'll do a nice 
marathon for you, and so forth and so on. Sometimes we feel like we're hitting walls, too. Doing the same things over and over again without any positive results. We might pray on a regular basis. And in some spiritual moments, we might ask ourselves, is anyone really out there? Are you listening, God? Are you there? We might even count others who speak discouragingly to us. Oh, you spend too much time with that church. Do something else. Oh, don't talk to me about religion. That's your kid. Don't talk to me about it. In times like this, it is important to look closely at the very question the disciples asked Jesus. What sustains you? Now, the answer for each of us might be a bit different, but it might be a bit different, but the basic essence should be whatever gets us back in touch with Christ. Now, for example, as a pastor, I enjoy planning and leading worship. But like any vocation, there come days when I feel dry, uninspired. When I wake up and I think to myself, Oh, I don't know if I've really got it in me today. In fact, it reminds me of a joke where this uh, gentleman is in bed on a Sunday morning. His mother pounds on the bed and says, it's time to get up, go to church. And he says, I don't want to get up. I just want to sleep in today. She says, no, 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 you've got to get up. Pound on his bed a little bit more, fervently. Oh, he said, I don't want to go. The people, they're sometimes mean to me, and, and, and oh, sometimes the, the hymns are lousy, and, and oh, sometimes that, the, the sermon is really dry and boring, and I just don't know if I really want to go. The mother bends down and says, look here. You're going to go to church for three reasons. Number one, it's the right thing to do. To worship God. Number two, you're 35 years old and you should be doing things like this. And number three, you're the pastor. <laughs> Sometimes we need to get in touch with something that sustains us. In my personal moments, I know it's time to take a walk and pray because the movement and time with God re-energizes my proverbial batteries. If you ever come in on Sunday morning, or excuse me, come in on any day in the week and you find me pacing around the sanctuary or something, that will tell you, huh? He's in prayer. He's thinking things out with God. He's trying to get back in touch. Or on nice days, and go outside, take a walk. That's that moment saying, God, I need to get it back in touch with you. Now sometimes the activity that dreams one person is what energizes another. In such cases, you just flip-flop with one another. A Christian writer I know spends hours reading and typing away in a closed room. But his way of reconnecting with Christ when his daily routine gets him down is to go out and serve in a soup kitchen where he interacts with people he talks with them, he helps them, he makes personal connections. Meanwhile, a Christian counselor who spends all day working with people must take time to read the Bible and pray alone, quietly, in order to feel that energy to fulfill her daily tasks. Even as a church, together, we can face the walls of discouragement and exhaustion. For example, in our own congregation, the financial challenges and the fact that our membership has significantly dwindled from over 1,200 people in its high point can get pretty discouraging and depressing. But this is the thing I want to say to you. If in those moments you look around and you say, this place has gone to pits, 
Or if you say this church is dead or dying. Or if you're tempted to say it's all going down the toilet. Stop. Stop. Don't say it. Because such things are rooted in fear, not in faith. Such things do not glorify God. And such things are not true. Now, granted, our faith church is facing challenges. But they are not unique to us. Christians and churches all over the nation and even in other parts of the world are facing the exact same challenges. One day I sat in my office and I was kind of moping about the fact that we didn't have many people in church that day. And if you remember Marika, who was here, who was cousin, who was here a couple of years ago, she happened to be walking by and she saw me sort of moping in there. She walked in, she said, so what's, what's wrong with you? And I said, oh, we didn't have many people in church today. Kind of depresses me. And she said, in my church, my pastor would be delighted to have that many. Really? Oh, yeah. Less than half of that would be a typical good Sunday for them. We are all facing the challenge of a different world. But the challenges, like I say, are not unique to us. They are daunting, but this is the thing we have to keep in mind. Frightening trials are not the same as imminent death. I'll say that again just to make sure we all hear this. Frightening trials are not the same as imminent death. They are simply trials that we have to face as Christians. And in the moment of the trials and, and difficulties, what are we called to do? To be faithful. To be faithful to Jesus Christ. And that's it. Our calling is to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing. Just like the ancient Israelites who endured exile and the desolation of their homeland, we must look forward to the promises that God makes. The promise that God made to those Israelites that we heard in the Old Testament passage this morning. He said, you have been scattered out and, and pulled apart and your dream is to come together and be Israel again. But I tell you, I'm going to bring you together to do much more than that. You are going to be a light to the nations, to the end of the earth. That was God's promise. And it was revealed in time through Jesus Christ. Again, we as Christians might say, we are in exile. We are a remnant in the midst of desolation. But we trust in the message of God who says, I will raise you up to be a light to the nations. And most importantly, as we go through that, we need to look at what sustains us. What sustains us? And I will say, it is not the pastor. It is not the organ. It is not the building. It is nothing like that. Our connection with Jesus Christ. This is what sustains us. And this is true for us as individuals, and it is true for us as a church. When we 
keep that connection with Jesus Christ. We are sustained with strength and power and hope. So friends, if you remember nothing else from the sermon today, at least remember this. Jesus Christ is your life. Jesus Christ is your hope. Jesus Christ is the one who sustains you now and always. Amen. We are all called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant, Jesus Christ. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Trust in Jesus Christ your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if so, please say I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you, if so, please say I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith? as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I do. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, please say I will. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say I will. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and the justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say I will. Will we, the members of the church, except Mike Niles, as a deacon chosen by God, through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we agree to pray for him, to encourage him, to respect his decisions, and to follow as he guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? At this time, I would invite all those who have been ordained as deacons to come forward. Mike, if you would kneel, please. And uh, place your hands on Mike. And if you can't get to Mike, you can place your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve and equip, and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you appointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the seventy elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit on Mike, that he may be faith, a faithful deacon in the church. Give him openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that he may see and serve wherever there is need. Train him in the school of prayer, that he may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip him with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of prayer power, and to communicate your presence and light among those who are powerless. In everything, give him the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give him joy in his walk of faith, and a sure sense of your abiding presence for his work in ministry. O oh God, we pray in need that through waters of baptism you have claimed us as your own and called us to share in Christ's ministry. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us that we may discern the gifts you have given, calling them forth from one another and together use these gifts for the good of all. In obedience to Christ and in the unity of the Spirit, may we proclaim good news, make disciples, be light and leaven, share our bread, offer a cup of cold water, wash one another's feet. Make us strong in Christ to live as your people and show forth your saving love in the world. By the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Mike, you are now ordained and installed as a deacon in this church and in the Presbyterian Church USA. I invite those who are around you to greet you into this ministry. I would uh, ask also that those of you who are deacons this year to meet me very briefly in the St. Emma Church office after worship just to look at calendars to see what our next meeting might be. Peace of God the Father and the Son.